record on this computer. Very nice. And I should have the PowerPoint here, which today is a PDF. Okay, so once again, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, here we are at the uh, course in fundamental principles in Catholic bioethics in the program of bioethics, the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University. Beginning as always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Actually, I'd like to use today, which happens to be March 19, the prayer of St. Joseph, which is uh, today's uh, feast. Uh, let's see if I can find it. There. No, it's not going to be the. I was looking for the mass prayer, but for the sake of time, here's the prayer. So let us pray together. O glorious Saint Joseph, faithful, faithful follower of Jesus Christ. To thee do we raise our hearts and hands to implore thy powerful intercession to obtain from the benign heart of Jesus all the helps and graces necessary for our spiritual and temporal welfare, particularly the grace of a happy death and the favor we now implore. Well, I think it's very appropriate at this time to pray for peace, in the Ukraine, peace in our hearts, peace in the world, especially this Lenten season may be a deep exercise of peace and to share that peace with those who surround us. And so we say, O glorious Saint Joseph, through the love thou bearest, to Jesus Christ and for the glory of his name. Part of our prayer, hear our prayers and obtain our petitions. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, our sisters, amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if you've seen the book that was written by Father Calloway on St. Joseph. Spectacular, fantastic, I recommend it. I think it was last year he published it, or maybe the year before, now I'm fuzzy, but it's not more than two years. And it's Devotion to St. Joseph. Look it up, Devotion to St. Joseph, beautiful. It's Consecration, sorry, Consecration to St. Joseph. Consecration to St. Joseph, I tell you, it is just gorgeous, exquisite. It's a 30-day consecration, and it can be interrupted. So it's very user-friendly, like this program. If uh, you cannot do it every day, then you just do whatever you need to do instead and come back to it wherever you left off. So the 30 days may take a whole year. It doesn't matter. It's still 30 days. <laughs> so it's a consecration to St. Joseph. Beautiful, gorgeous. It's translated to Spanish also. And uh, I went through it twice. <laughs> and he has really, really renewed my priesthood, you know, because we need to highlight the, the man in our society and the, the character of man as a leader, the leader in the family, the leader in society, the leader of ourselves. We need to start by believing in ourselves that we're truly God's image for a purpose. And we need to lead, we need to lead ethically, spiritually with courage, you know, and think of Zelensky, for example, <laughs> right? And the Ukraine, which is a very Catholic country. Hmm? And Vladimir Putin is supposed to be a Christian also, supposed to be Orthodox. So we need prayer <laughs> and we need action. We need to take into our hands uh, the leadership that the Lord is expecting from each one of us. Joseph led the Holy Family. 
tremendously. And he was so humble, we don't even have a single word of his. We have a few words from Mary, <laughs> but not a single word, but he led by action. And to be just husband of Mary and foster father of Jesus already says volumes about the man, you know, uh, how he was able to maintain chastity with the most beautiful, I mean, not only chastity, because all married couples are called chastity, but celibacy. See, Joseph also had a vow of celibacy. According to tradition, it's not in scripture, but according to tradition, Joseph also had a vow of celibacy. So when that marriage was arranged by their families, according to the Jewish tradition, you know, at some point, Mary and Joseph had to tell each other, already betrothed, because the betrothal had gone on already. In other words, the engagement had gone on formally between the two families. Those two young people had to tell each other that they had made a vow of celibacy, of perpetual celibacy. <laughs> Oops. And the big emphasis in Judaism and in many cultures to this day is on children and progeny because considered a blessing from God. And to not have children was a curse from God. <laughs> Right? So these two marry again, according to tradition, between 12 and 15 years of age. And Joseph, not an old man, because that takes away all of his credibility. An old man that was so senior that he couldn't even get an erection, please. You know, that takes away his character. And to boot that there was a second marriage, and so we can justify the half brothers of Jesus, like James. <laughs> no, with all due respect, that is not Catholic, that may be Protestant, but it's not Catholic. Joseph was young, most likely, because he had to endure tremendous hardship. He had to walk his family to Egypt, <laughs> all right? And it wasn't just Mary who was carrying the baby. Maybe Joseph had to carry Mary and the baby at some point. They started with a donkey, maybe, the donkey may have died along the way. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying, look, Joseph was married to the most gorgeous woman in the world, inside and out. And for about 30 years, he had to defend her with all kinds of, from all kinds of aggressors, even in Nazareth as they were living there. Right? So anyway, I'm definitely on a wide tangent here, but take a look at the book. It's, it's just, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, it highlights Joseph, and we need Josephs today in society. <laughs> it's what we need, <laughs> you know, that's what we need. So um, what was my few minutes now? The name is Consecration to St. Joseph. Uh, the author is Father Calloway. Calloway, Calloway. Uh, no, with a C, uh, let's see. Let's go to it for a moment, yeah. Walmart has it. Walmart has a prayer to St. Joseph. <laughs> We're living bizarre times. Actually, Walmart is, the fellow is uh, supposed to be Catholic, not the owner, is it? Walmart? Walmart owner? I think the Walmart uh, Domino owner, Domino Pizza is, is that guy, right? Yeah, you have, yeah? Okay. Yeah, uh, okay. Well, so, here it is. Just trying to look for the, yeah. Calo Y, C A double L O Way, W A Y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 13 bucks. 14 bucks. All right. So, uh, any uh, questions or comments from previous stuff? Going to do a brief summary. Mm, at the end, remind me please also to talk about the internship and to talk about the other course, which is Bio 514, which you should be uh, getting into also, all right, which is basically online. <laughs> Again, it's going to be all about summaries. So remind me to talk about those two things, okay, at the end. Thank you. Right. What do we have? Just a very brief summary because we're halfway, we're, we're more than halfway now. We're into lecture six out of, I think, 11 or something like that, right? And therefore, uh, it's a good moment to pause for a moment and think. Uh, I'm proposing this, this first course is the 
phylogenetic origin of uh, Homo sapiens, right? To try to be true and fair, both to the, uh, the physical evidence of, for example, fossil record and stuff like that. And at the same time, to be true and fair to our beliefs as believers in God who is creator and that we are his image. So how to reconcile those two. And what I'm proposing is that far from being opposite to each other, again, as typically fundamentalists hold uh, that you either believe in Darwin or you believe in God, uh, they actually complement each other. Faith and reason, science and religion, they complement each other and they truly give us the fuller picture the fuller picture, okay? And so the origin of the human, biologically speaking, we are a species. Organically, there's no question that we uh, need nourishment and everything else, that we have a biological body that functions just the same at the level of metabolism than any other biological body that lives, all right? Down to the cellular level. And so there's that, and it did just appear mm, out of the blue, rather it evolved, all right? So now once we say that we have evolved, we have evolved from what <laughs> or from whom, right? And that's where uh, it gets sticky because we evolved from common ancestors of other species that are also living today, that are also contemporary. And the closest to us, now when I talk about percentage homology, you understand what I'm saying? The percentage compatibility between our genome and the chimp genome, pan troglodytes is the scientific name of the chimp. Troglo. Yes, this is our nearest neighbor, biologically speaking. <laughs> this is our nearest cousin, biologically speaking. The compatibility is 99 percentage homology, 99 percentage, okay? Uh, with uh, gorilla, actually I think it's gorilla, gorilla. Yeah, scientific name, gorilla, just to emphasize. <laughs> That's the male. They always put the male. I'm going to show you a female today also. Look at this guy's posting. They say he was posting for the <laughs> photo. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but it looks very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> okay. Gorilla, 98%. And orangutan, which is the other cousin, <laughs> the third, third degree cousin in the third degree. This is cousin in the second degree. Ninety-seven percent. Right. So, chimp ninety-nine percent, gorilla ninety-eight uh, percent, orangutan ninety-seven percent. And uh, like the French say, la petite différence. <laughs> and that one to three percentage difference makes all the difference of the world, including technology and all kinds of stuff that we'll see uh, in the remainder of the course that makes us human and not, but we are technically one of the primates. We are one of the four primates, right? Primates. Uh, Father Chelsea. This, yep. That only applies to men, right? Again, please. <laughs> that only applies to men. <laughs> no, I'm just, it's just a joke. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, and so, you know, that's percentage homology, which means that there's a common ancestor. There's a common ancestor with a chimp. That's the, lead, the most recent node is a common ancestor with a chimp. And then, Going back, logically, there would be a next common ancestor, a next node with the gorilla, all right? But at that point, chimp and human together 
would have a common ancestor with the gorilla. Okay, and then with the orangutan, we would have to go back another third node. So that node would be a common node between the orangutan and the gorilla and the chimp and the human. Those are nodes, okay? So nodes denote common ancestry. But if we trace it back enough, you know, um, percentage, percentage homology between human and fly. All right, to throw it out there. 60%, right? Now this is Drosophila. Drosophila melanogaster is the fly that is used, it's a fruit fly. You leave a banana open and you get the little gnats, right? The little fruit flies. Uh, fruit fly. There we go. No, give me, give me. All right. So we are 60% homologous with these guys. <laughs> we have more in common than not. All right. 60% homology. It's amazing. But you know what's pointing to what happens is the homology is going to be in the basic body plan. For example, the Hox genes, you know, the, the, homeos, the, the uh, homeotic box. Right, Hox, H O X is the abbreviation. Homeotic box means that there's a basic body plan, head, trunk, and tail, <laughs> for example. And probably the wings are in the 40% that is not compatible, that is not homologous. <laughs> but the fact that they have legs, and we have legs, the fact that they have eyes on the head, all that is right. So the more basic stuff, what we call the regulatory genes. And the regulatory genes also that get the embryonic stages uh, developed. That's also why we have the other line of evidence is that the comparative embryology, right? The fact that they uh, use sexual reproduction. So one sperm fertilizes one egg. At the zygote level, we share zygotes with all animals and plants. So how about percentage homology with a plant, you know, with slash pine? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I'm curious. Uh, let's do this. Maybe I can save some of the wording. Percentage homology between human and, let's see if it's been done. <laughs> and just, uh, Playing around here. Analysis, Analogy, that's a dominant 60%. It may not have been done, I don't know, but it would be interesting or to any plant really. Yeah, I tell you what, we can use the um, one, one the plant that was, um, so early on, I remember in the 90s, when the Human Genome Project was going on, 1990 to 2000, right? Craig Venter and uh, uh, it was an international project uh, to um, decipher the human genome and to have it out there for, for research. Mm, anyway, one plant that was done was a, a plant, I think it's called dill mustard or something like that, but it was um, arabidosis. Arabic doses. Let's see. Between human and Arabic doses. Let's see if it has it. This is one of the plants that was sequenced early on. Uh, early on, expressing human better. Yeah. No. It's, uh, I'm not going to waste more time on this. It's getting into the actual articles. But uh, that'd be interesting if anyone wants to do a little project, <laughs> Arabidosis thaliana, with any plant. Find the percentage homology between uh, the human genome and any plant genome, just to put it out there, <laughs> okay? Or with fungus, for example, any fungus, any mushroom. And there's gonna be some percentage. It might be 2%, it might be 10%, it might be 40%. You know, this is percentage homology because when we go back, that's pointing to common ancestry. Those 
faraway nodes, those remote nodes, but they're still there, okay? Anyway, uh, so that with our belief that we're creating God's image and that the Lord is with us, is actually deeper within us than we can possibly realize and so forth. So it goes into the realm of mystery and faith allows us to delve in mystery and then to uh, study it systematically with what we call theology. And then the tool of theology, the wrench and the pliers of theology is philosophy. So this course does biology, philosophy, and theology, and anthropology, and archaeology, and all those logies are built in because logy is just, you know, study. Logos, the word to study. And we looked at then the evidence for evolution and that we're not exempt. So we can say possibly, okay, well, I grant you evolution for the rest of the creatures on earth, right? Including the chimp, but we're different because we're human. And look at a chimp and look at a human. I mean, we're totally different. When was the last time you saw a chimp in the wild dressing up, you know, or going to a restaurant or getting into the car or going to the moon, <laughs> right? And so we're radically different. Therefore, God, uh, okay, Darwin made everything else, but God made the human. No, that's fantasy. We're not exempt because the chimp sleeps and we sleep and the chip mates and we mate and so forth. The other way so far without excluding the vitro clinics to make a human naturally is by mating, all right? Identical in the process biologically than the non-humans. So the sperm still needs to fertilize the egg, even in the in the in vitro clinic for the human. Then once we realize and we swallow the reality, the humbly reality that we too have evolved as a species, now we're going further into the mechanisms of evolution. The mechanism that makes sense. Okay. Which by the way, Darwin, I keep forgetting to bring a book, a copy of the origin of species. The origin of species was the big bomb that he launched in uh, the uh, 1800s, 1858, I think it was, or 59. And of course, it was against everything that was believed at that time with regards to uh, creation of the human and creation of the species also and so forth, because it was basically a fundamentalistic approach to sacred scripture. <clears throat> and so that's why he was scared. By the way, Darwin, I don't know if I mentioned, but uh, Darwin was uh, reticent to publish his theory because he knew the bombshell that was going to hit, and that he was going to be critiqued and all that. And he was holding back. <clears throat> However, he had a friend who was younger than him called Alfred Wallace. Alfred Wallace was down south, I think he was in New Zealand or somewhere out there. And he was looking at the rarity of the species, or maybe he was in Indonesia. Anyway, he was somewhere out in the Southeast, South Asia, Southeast Asia. And Alfred Wallace was also an archeologist and an anthropologist and a naturalist. And he was observing variation and he was observing uh, <clears throat> different species. And he came up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. And Wallace wrote up an article and he sent a draft to Darwin to get his opinion about natural selection, about the mechanism of evolution, which is natural selection, okay? This is Alfred Wallace. He sends this draft to Darwin to get Darwin's opinion. And when Darwin sees the draft of Wallace, he freaks out. He says, someone else has come up with the same theory. So I better publish quickly <laughs> before this other guy publishes. <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> Wallace was just an article. It wasn't a full book. So that's when uh, Darwin already had the draft of the book, all right? But Darwin did not send Wallace the draft of the book. <laughs> to get Dar Wallace's opinion, as far as we know. Darwin went ahead, finally, and swallowed hard and published the book, all right? The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Then, <clears throat> so everything else is history. 
So we're going to look at selection, right? Oh, so the four main mechanisms, uh, I know Meyer has about seven of them, but they can be collapsed. For example, he has transposons different from uh, mutation. And I think he may have crossover also different, uh, crossover or um, uh, <clears throat> oh, the other term doesn't come to me right now. But anyway, <clears throat> those three I collapsed into mutation. Bona fide mutation as in UV hitting the DNA and causing a mutation, right? Or uh, cross-linking, crossover during uh, meiosis, during the development of the gametes, or uh, transposition, which is whole chunks of genes, whole chunks of DNA jumping from one chromosome to another even, all right? All those I clustered under the general topic of mutation. But that's really where it starts. And so evolution starts at the molecular level. Now, again, you can think with our mind's eye, right? That most, because 97% of our genome is what we call junk. In other words, it doesn't code for a gene, right? It doesn't code for a protein, 97%. Even though it's dispersed, it's not just a tail end of one chromosome that is the three percent that has all the, the twenty thousand genes. No, it's spread out through all the whole uh, chromatin, all the twenty-three pairs. But uh, <clears throat> on average, when a mutation uh, mutates, causes a change in the DNA, on average, is going to hit the junk DNA as opposed to any one of the 3%, you see? It's just like when a satellite falls to earth, is it gonna fall on land or on water? Well, three fourths of the earth's surface is water. So on average, it's gonna fall on, on water in the ocean. And that's a good thing. So it doesn't fall on top of people or in a, in a city, right? So on average, when either satellites or meteorites uh, hit the earth, uh, they fall in the ocean, <coughs> the Pacific Ocean. In fact, there's actually a designated area that is the graveyard of satellites when they become dysfunctional. It's estimated that uh, there are about 2,000 satellites, I think, uh, uh, orbiting the Earth that are active. For example, communication. Right now, this thing is being transmitted from St. Thomas University to the cloud somewhere, to the virtual cloud, and then it's it's being beamed down into Alabama <laughs> uh, through the cloud, right through a satellite. So there are about 2,000, I think, that are active, but there is a total of 6,000. So it's beginning to get crowded up there. And they use, uh, the, they use distance, you know, uh, what they call that uh, outer orbit, inner orbit uh, stuff, mm, like the ISS, the International Space Station, I think is in the inner orbit around the earth and a number of satellites are further out so they don't collide with each other. But they're, so they're about, it's, it's estimated a total of 6,000 satellites that we have put out since whenever for decades. And so that means that there are 4,000 or 40,000, sorry, 40,000 satellites out there <laughs> that are disabled, that are no longer functional like old watches, for example, you know, and uh, they've just been neglected and they're still spinning around in the same orbit. So periodically, they're either brought down or come down or go out into outer space. <laughs> either way, they get out of orbit. Uh, and there is a designated area in the, uh, I think it's in the Pacific somewhere where they bring stuff down. <laughs> In fact, the ISS, the International Space Station, is going to come down. It's becoming obsolete in a, like 2030 or something like that, just around the corner. Uh, this guy. Oh, by the way, there was a protest. Uh, some of the Russian, this International Space Station, this is the largest artifact that man has ever created. Okay. And there was a mission of uh, Russians going up and exchanging things, and I just saw it in the news this morning, 
three of those Russians were Russians, astronauts, wore Ukrainian uniforms instead, instead of the standard gray stuff that they wear. Yeah. Okay, so he's getting more and more pressure from within. A lot of soldiers, Russian soldiers, didn't have a clue where they were going, what they're going to do. They were actually killing Ukrainians. And so there's defections going on. The Ukrainians are rescuing Russian soldiers and sending them back to their families. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so he's getting in deeper and deeper doo-doo. And he better think about the, already he's I'm talking about Putin is lowering his standards uh, about uh, this megalomaniac glory of the greater Russia again. So uh, we talked about the four mechanisms that affect evolution, which is mutation, then migration, then um, drift and selection, right? So migration, you can think of, that's at the level of the entire individual organism. And remember populations. So population is the uh, uh, unit. We can talk about some units, for example, the basic unit of matter, the stable, the adjective is important here. The stable unit of matter is the atom. Even though we know about subatomic particles, but subatomic particles are unstable by themselves. So when they come together to form an atom, then that's a stable unit of matter. All matter, as far as we know, of the universe. So that's a pretty broad statement. The atom is a stable unit of matter, okay? Then the cell, is the basic unit of life. So far, this is evidence-based. In other words, uh, any organism that we have found on planet Earth living today, of the about 2 million species that have been classified, their basic unit is the cell, all right? To the point that a number, a good number of, of, of species are unicellular. But then we get multicellularity and a division of labor and specialization of cells, specialized cells. So we get multicellular organisms all the way up to the human. Then, so I'm doing units. Uh, the organism, the individual organism is the standard unit of a species. So each species is made up of organisms individual organisms of that same species, right? Remember, Meyer's definition of species, biological definition of species has two components. They can mate and they can produce fertile offspring, all right? And so the next level is population. Once we talk about population, then we get into population biology and the ecosystem, right? So with population, the basic unit of a population is two or more individuals of the same species. So I'm hoping that it's starting to make sense and you're beginning to synthesize things. Remember when I was in seminary, after four years of theology, we have to do the comps, the comprehensive exams. Mm -hmm. And I don't, do you have comps in medicine? Uh, not not as board. such. The board, which is kind of equivalent, is crunch time, right? big time for the whole program. So our, the equivalent for us is comprehensive. Uh, and so it was a time for integrating and synthesizing. <laughs> Those are the two key words. So the fourth year theology, the small group, we were only, I think we're about 10 or 11 in our class. It's a regional seminary in uh, Boynton Beach, Florida. We would get together to integrate and synthesize four years of theology. <laughs> Heavy duty. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> so when we get to the level of population, biologically speaking, right? Two or more individuals of the same species. We know what species is, biological, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the forces that work on the population. So migration, migration, which has those two movements in and out. But you know that migration is a dynamic system because a population, individuals within the population, any given individual within the population is migrating in and out. And some individuals migrate more than others. Uh, huge flocks of individuals migrate throughout from north to south, for example, when 
the ones I just uh, the ones that migrate the most, I would say, typically are birds and on land and fish in the ocean. Whales, for example, whale pods. You know what keeps the pod together is the song. So each whale pod, which would be a population, think of, uh, I don't know, the humpback is the typical, but the largest whale is actually the blue whale, right? The largest animal on earth is the blue whale. And interesting diagram. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, so whales, the groups of whales, a population of whales is called a pod, right? POD. And uh, <clears throat> how do they stay together? Because they do have eyes, but they have tiny eyes. And they cannot see too well, especially when the water is murky. And just, I mean, you get away, these guys need distance, right? So a mile is not inconceivable to have a distance between whales. Uh, and uh, so th they lose sight of each other. But how do they keep the pot together? They keep the pot together by sounds and by songs. So each whale pod of the same species will have a song. You've heard those, right? Things, right? It became popular at one point in, uh, in the hippie uh, movement, uh, the whale songs. Remember, you can buy LPDs, so <laughs> long play LPs, <laughs> whale songs, and, and, and fall asleep. Anyway, the pod stays together by the song because it's not that the whales figure it out, they just realize, I mean, uh, by instinct, sound travels longer than sight in water, in the medium. So sound, a sound needs a medium to travel. It's a wave, but it needs a medium. Thank God that sound needs a medium. Otherwise, we would be just deaf from the cacophony of the stuff that's occurring in the universe. Imagine a supernova exploding or the formation of a galaxy or something like that. That noise would be, the, it would kill us. The noise of, we were like one of those bombs, compression bombs, I don't know what they're called, these bombs that create a wave, a sound wave that just knocks people out, okay? So that's nothing compared to the sound of, uh, of, uh, of a sun exploding or something like that, or collapsing. So, but because there is vacuum, <laughs> right? The sound doesn't travel through space. But sound needs to travel. Remember the little uh, telegraphs that we use as kids when you, you put a cup or a tin can and then a wire, and the other guy is far away, the other person, and we can talk to each other and hear each other, right? Because the, the wire the, is actually transmitting the wave. It acts like a miniature uh, guitar string. <laughs> it's fascinating. And if we were in a vacuum here, I could be talking my head off and you wouldn't be able to listen. <laughs> so whales figured out that, well, they didn't figure out, they just evolution <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> and so they keep the pot together by the songs. Same species, different pods. So they have different songs, different pods. And it's been documented mostly with humpbacks, I think. It's the one that studied the most, I think, the, of the whales. They keep each other together. I'm just saying that because there's migration. But there may be this young humpback whale who is a young male, you know, he's a beta male and he's looking for a mate. So he's going to wander away from the pod and go into another pod of the same humpbacks because he hear, heard a different song <laughs> and he's wandering in there and he's trying to get a mate. Well, that's migration. What is he taking with him? His genes. If he finds a young female over there in that other pod that is willing and able, then he's passing on the genes, the, 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 the germplasm, <laughs> the genome from his pod to the other pod, to pod B, right? Pod A, pod B. And so that's just an example. So when you think of migration evolutionarily, we can think of individuals within a population as gene bags, gene bags, right? And then that gene bag is just moving with the individual in and out. All right, so that's migration. Then the next one was um, drift. 
drift is chance. So it's interesting that chance is integrated into the universe. Chance, when you think about that, flipping a coin, you can he get heads or tails, all right? So chance is integrated into the universe. Think about that for a little bit because Einstein also picked on that. When he was developing his theories of um, uh, relativity, he realized that chance also is integral to, so that's why he changed to probabilities. And he talked about probabilities. In fact, we can say that there is a probability that we are here today, present, <laughs> all right? Either physically or virtually. It's a 99.9999% probability, <laughs> but it's never gonna be 100% in the empirical world, okay? So, <clears throat> Probability is built into the universe. And that is why we have to allow, that's why we have to create another category by itself, if you will, which in evolution is called drift, all right? Or gene, uh, uh, gene flow. Oh, no, sorry, genetic drift, genetic drift. Genetic. genetic drift, yeah, gene flow is migration. Drift, as in drift wood, right? Genetic drift. In other words, a piece of wood floating on the ocean, where does it go? Well, it could go to India, but it could land in South America, depending on the currents, right? But there's an element of chance, which is very interesting. So this is, and Meyer wrestled with that, okay? So there's determinism, but then there's also chance built into the thing. And so we got chance at the level of mutation and we got chance at the level of the organism as a whole, the individual, because it's the individual who's carrying the genes, whether mutated or not. And then finally, the fourth category, which is this selection or the four uh, force is selection, which we'll look at today. Okay. Everybody okay? So there are three types of selection, artificial selection, natural selection, and sexual selection. In fact, humans have been doing artificial selection for millennia, okay? And that's why Darwin picked up on the word of natural selection, because we're actually mimicking nature, whether we knew it or not. Here's an example of artificial selection. The apple, as we know it today, is much larger than the original crab apple, which is the wild apple, okay? It's called crab apple. And it's small and it's bitter and it has a lot of seeds <laughs> because it's kind of ideal for what? For a bird or a mammal to eat it, uh, enjoy and get nourishment out of the starch that makes the fruit the seed is resistant to the gastric acids. And so the seed will go through the system and be pooped out somewhere else. So this is a kind of migration <laughs> at the seed level, okay? And not only that, when the seed is dropped, it even comes with a package of uh, phosphates and nitrates <laughs> from the bird or the mammal, okay? So the, sea, the, the fruit had to be small enough for a bird or an, a mammal to be able to swallow it. Maybe chew a little bit and then swallow. Then humans started doing selection. So how do we do selection? Let's say that we want to make from a crab apple a Macintosh. <laughs> well, just by size, we're gonna select, we have to find out, we, first we have to determine what phenotype we're interested in. And we may have several phenotypes, but this just concentrate on one phenotype for now. Let's say just size. So I wanna make the crab apple a large, big Macintosh or whatever the largest apple is. So we're selecting for size. 
All right, so we have a crab apple tree. It's putting out a number of apples of crab apple fruit, right? What's gonna be within that one individual tree? What's going to happen? When the fruit comes out, This one is an apple tree with fruits. Now it's gonna give me the bloom. I don't want the bloom, I want the fruit. Okay. So let's say that we measure these very precisely. Right away, we can see of these two here, I hope you can see the pointer of these two, which one is larger? Just from plain sight, this one here seems to be larger, right? At least to my eyes. This one's smaller. So we're just selecting for size. See, what do we have among all the apples, all the little crab apples of this one tree? This is always coming from one tree, from one individual, right? What do we have between the, the apples themselves? Variation. Exactly. We have variation within the one individual. So we pick this apple, the seeds, and we plant those. Fast forward. The next generation, the, so this would be the P generation, but P, oh no, the P, the parental, P for parental, but we're not mating, we're just using this one. Okay, so we plant this, the F1 is going to be on average, this is gonna be the average size. So for example, let's say that uh, this is the average size, the smaller is the average size of all the apples, okay? meaning that there are some that are even smaller than this to make the average. But this one is off the norm, uh, on the high side, on the big. All right, so now we plant this. On average, statistically, this new tree, this would be the average size. So there would be some that are larger and some that are smaller, but the average is gonna be bigger than the parent, that this tree. So now we select the largest of that, apple and plant that one and keep going, right? And so we're selecting on size. We do enough generations, eventually we come up with a crab apple that's this big, <laughs> enough generations. I don't know how many generations it takes, but we got time, you know, and uh, humans have been doing this for millennia, mostly on agriculture. And the typical thing has been size, for example, wheat, which wheat comes from grasses. Have you ever seen the little flower of a grass? And inside that flower, there's going to be a little tiny seed of the grass. Well, wheat is a grass <laughs> that has been selected and grown to something that we can actually see and chew and eat and get nourishment out of, All right? So natural selection, the, the Fertile Crescent about 5,000 years before the time of Christ in the Middle East, what is today Iran and Iraq, that's the agricultural beginnings of civilization. So we have been doing artificial selection for millennia. We do it mostly for food, for agriculture. For example, from the wild mustard, we get cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kale, and something called kohlrabi, kohlrabi. I've never tasted it. But uh, so we get all that from different parts of the wild mustard. Good question. Uh, short answer, I don't know. My first instinct is that they are actually variants of the same species. So how do we answer that question? We would sequence broccoli DNA and we would sequence cauliflower DNA and cabbage and then see percentage homology. I suspect that it's gonna be 99.99% homologous. But it could be on the way to speciation. That's the whole point, that variation eventually in plants, yes, but more in animals. What happens in animals, they start not um, recognizing each other. So let's switch to animals. For example, in breeding, for uh, just for the sake of um, the pet industry. So for aesthetics, these are the little lovebirds, right? You see the variation in color? This is all variation, it's one species. So they can interbreed. 
so it's one species, it's just a wide variation. But they were selected. And so now we can do novel selection. Let's say we made the white one with this one that has a black head and green and yellow. And let's see what comes out. Maybe this one over here with a gray head, maybe that's the product of mating these two, I don't know. But we can start combining and we would expect variation among the chicks and even among siblings. This could be, potentially these could be siblings. <laughs> it's interesting to see. So there's a great variety in this species, right? At some point, some of these individuals are so distinct from each other that they start failing to recognize each other as the same species and they will not mate but they will mate with others that are more recognizable. By the way, the mating may not just be the color, it may be the smell, or it may be the way they rub their beaks. You know that these guys are always, that's what they call dog birds, right? They're always kissing each other with the beaks. They're always, I don't know what they're doing there, but I guess they're stimulating some kind of glands that they have on the, on the nose or the beak, the nostril, which is on the top of the beak there. So they're constantly, and it's typically the male and the female, that's what they call love birds. So at some point, maybe there'll be a change by chance, a mutation that they don't recognize each other. So they won't mate, but they'll mate with another. And so that's the beginning of speciation there, okay? When individuals of the same population fail to recognize each other as the same population. So we do it for aesthetics. In the pet industry, uh, the fish industry, for example, uh, all the exotics, the birds are the two typical ones. We do it also for uh, animal husbandry, which is the animal equivalent of agriculture, <laughs> right? For example, all of these animals have been domesticated. The turkey, the donkey, the horse, the sheep, chickens, cows, right? All these have been domesticated and have made them bigger, generally, or fatter, <laughs> for, or more milk producing through artificial selection. Now, even they get down to the cellular level, they do uh, artificial insemination, for example, with the studs of the, uh, of the uh, bulls and so forth, the horses, the thoroughbreds, so this industry has gotten pretty sophisticated, but it's all artificial selection. And even a featherless chicken, because imagine what's labor intensive for the chicken is to pluck those feathers, right? A machine, I don't think is gonna do it. <laughs> and so uh, featherless chickens, there's a problem with the featherless chicken. Cannot go in the sun because it will fry alive, <laughs> right? No feathers no melanin, no protection. So they have to keep that indoors. And then if you gotta keep them indoors then you gotta also provide the uh, proper temperature and everything else. But yeah, fell of those chickens. The only difference is that this is willed. The human volition, the human will is engaged. I want to do this. We want to do this as a project. We're gonna make money from it. All right, so artificial selection has the will engage. Natural selection, there's no will engage, unless we wanna talk about the will of the creator, but indirectly, okay? So the, the creator willed it this way to begin with, when he established the laws that govern evolution and the laws that govern nature and the laws that govern the universe, but not at the individual level. So, Random made uh, natural selection then, and Darwin basically just borrowed the term from artificial selection. That's why I say it was embarrassing to go at a restaurant with Darwin because he would start playing with his food and say, oh yeah, this comes from this and this comes from that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so he realized, I mean, he was very aware of artificial selection. I think he was involved in a number of projects in his own. Uh, uh, trophy. See, Christina. Can you hear me well? Yes, a little better. Thank okay, you. thank you. So, um, so let's say that it, when Darwin, Darwin was um, observing this natural artificial selection was okay, but 
today it will be a real ethical problem, correct? Because what you just said, it is for money and it is for industry and it is for, uh, yeah. I mean, like the fear, fearless chicken, I didn't even know that exists. I exactly. mean, um, so yeah, with ethics, that would be a big, big problem that we're doing this with all these species. Well, it, yes, so that's why this is bioethics, right? And so there is a concern for sure. A, the concern, what is the concern? How do we justify a featherless chicken? Well, first of all, there needs to be regulation to, so that the chicken is treated humanely. A chicken doesn't need feathers to survive, all right? So it's not essential for the chicken. It's not like a heart or a vital organ but the chicken needs to be kept indoors. If we put the chicken outdoors, then that's cruelty to an animal. And that's unethical. You see how the argument goes? So it's not that a featherless chicken is intrinsically evil. No, it's justified for what? For feeding the world. Because chicken is a very popular food, right? And it's a good source of protein and it's not red meat, so it has less cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So in principle, growing featherless chickens is okay, but they have to be treated humanely. That's where the ethics comes in, but it's not intrinsic evil. We have to be clear about that. Right? It's not an intrinsic I, evil. It can be justified, I, I, but there has to be a justification. I get it. I get it. You're right. But I also have another concern. Yep. <laughs> and that is, once we start doing all this as humans, uh, I, it will be okay if it's only with the genes that are in those individuals, with those organisms. But why do we start putting other things like uh, other chemicals that are not necessarily natural in these individuals, that are affecting tremendously the product that could be happening with everything, grapes and watermelons and strawberries and all these animals. And then going into more, we continue doing this with humans. And just, it's just a comment, but it, it brings that concern. Yes, and we will be cover all those issues. It will hit different parts of the course of the program. Some of them will cover at the beginning of human life with the embryo experimentation, for example. Of course, we make a big difference between human and non-human experimentation. We can do some level of experimentation in the human, but it has to be justified and there has to be consent from the individual. So how do we get consent from an embryo? Impossible, right? And so this is just a foretaste of what's coming up in the next uh, course, which is the beginning of life. And then also we'll pick it up a little bit on environmental bioethics and we'll pick it up also in the healthcare bioethics course with regards to uh, transplantation and growing organs, growing human organs in uh, pigs, for example, and so forth. Okay, so all this is coming on, hold on, uh, hang in there, but we're addressing all these issues precisely. This is a major part of the program as a whole how to navigate between joint and marrow, because we cannot say, oh, shut down, never do any experiment, no. For example, uh, antibiotics have been introduced into wheat, antibiotics for the human, or drought resistant. Let me give a simpler example. Drought resistance genes into wheat. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's definitely a good thing because there are many millions of people that live in the Sahel. The Sahel is the borders of the Sahara Desert and they get little rain, mostly dry. So to have wheat that is resistant to drought is a good thing. They could have a crop every year to feed those millions of people. Wheat, a lot of bread, <laughs> all right? Or beans could also be engineered. That's GMO, genetically engineered organisms right? Genetically manufactured. So we get into all that. I'm setting the basis here, all right? But there is concern. There's ethical concern. Then we have to decide. The human decides what's ethical, what's unethical. And when it comes to the human, consent is fundamental. 
All right, so let's look at uh, five of Darwin's observations and then the inference, in other words, the conclusions that he makes from these five observations, because these are basically his five key observations to land on natural selection as the mechanism in the big picture. So first he notices that there is an overabundance of gametes and an overabundance of zygotes wherever he goes. I'm gonna show you a slide of each one of these in a moment. So now I'm just giving you like a little summary first. So there's an overabundance of fertility in, in, uh, in the production of gametes and in the production of zygotes. So before and after fertilization. Then on the other hand, populations in nature tend to be stable over time. The individuals may change, but the overall number, for example, the 300 slash pine that we have here in the forest, adult slash pine, individuals die and get replaced, but that's a stable community, okay? So there seems to be stability at the level of populations in nature, the numbers. But also resources are limited. There's so only so many maple trees that a moose can eat in a, in a given region. And therefore the resources are limited. And that's basically what's going to establish the stability of the population. Also bringing in the whole issue of variation that no two individuals within a population are exactly identical, there's variation. That means that some of those variations may be more suited for survival than others. And Finally, that these variations are heritable. Now he still did not know about Mendel, but this one, this fifth observation, he could have had the mechanical, he could have had the molecular clue for that had he read Mendel's paper and understood it. But he did observe that variations are heritable. You know, from crab apples, we get more crab apples. So let me give you a slide of each one of these. Here is the high fertility. Poor production of gametes. Well, I can just point out, for example, how many sperm does it take to fertilize one egg? One sperm. Did you know that clinically for a human ejaculate to be considered potent, in other words, capable of fertilizing, it needs to have, you know how many sperm? Between 100 and 150 million. That's the, the average for a fertile ejaculate, okay? A hundred million, and it only takes one. So there's an overabundance of gametes produced because the vast majority don't make it to fertilization. The vast majority don't make it. On average, here is the probabilistic system coming in, statistics, on average, which sperm is the one that's going to fertilize that egg that created us? On average, it's going to be the fastest, strongest, most vigorous sperm. So it's carrying those genes. On average, it will be the most vigorous sperm that fertilizes that egg. And so on average, we are the healthiest individuals that could have been generated from that ejaculate of our parents. It's a statistical model because it could be that the actual strongest sperm got caught in some kind of scar tissue along the fallopian tube and never made it, <laughs> okay? So there is that chance inherent in the system. The level of zygotes, these are, I think these are frog eggs. How many, how many uh, zygotes does it take? How many embryos does it take to replace the two frogs, the father and mother frog? It just takes two to replace them. This dandelion, how many dandelion seeds does it take to replace this one individual? One seed, right? So on and so forth. These are pollen grains. Uh, the PDF, I can't take it. These are pollen grains. Uh, some germs sprout, these are individuals sprouting. 
from, from the seeds. This is a mushroom exploding. These are spores of a mushroom, the gazillion spores. Each one, this is a little micrograph of the individual spores. From each one of these spores, you get a new fungus, okay? Imagine if all of these spores actually grew, we'd be littered, we'd be covered with, with uh, fungi, too many. Here, for example, is pine tree. This yellow cloud, that's pollen. The yellow cloud is pollen. You, you, you just wash your car and now has a thin layer of yellow dust on it. That's the pollen grains. Again, gazillion of these pollen grains. And it only takes one pollen grain to fertilize the one egg to make the individual, to replace the individual that put out all of this pollen. Here's a single crab, female crab with, I don't know how many thousands of eggs, hundreds of thousands of eggs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's this overabundance. The vast majority of these will not make it. The vast majority of those little embryos, frog embryos are gonna be what? food or other animals, right? So populations remain stable. You see, if all of these individuals grew, that would not be stable, right? That would be a log phase. We would be in this phase of the curve where the populations are multiplying, the individuals are multiplying at a prodigious rate. But no, we see that most populations arrive at what we call the carrying capacity. They stabilize because of limited resources. One example here is a baby turtle that a new hatchling that got caught by a crab. So this one never made it to the ocean from the sand where they come out of the sand to the shore that's just a few feet away this poor little turtle never made it because it got caught by a crab. So that one's eliminated. This baby turtle will never make it to adulthood and pass on its genes. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. We'll get it in next. Exactly. Yes, it is, but uh, we'll cover, we'll have a whole lecture on, on contraception and why that in itself is an intrinsic evil. Mm -hmm. All right, and, uh, but I can say this so far that CK represents the carrying capacity. Every species has a carrying capacity, whether it's plant, animal, fungi, even bacteria. There's so many, there's only that many bacteria that can fit on the tip of a pin. <laughs> All right, so every species has a carrying capacity in nature when we observe them on the spot except for the human. We don't know what the carrying capacity is for the human, picking up on the fact that we're a single population, we just don't know how many humans the earth can hold. Why? Because we have artificial selection, because we can generate our own food. Now they're talking about synthetic food, right? We make our own food, we make our own buildings, condominiums, so the same piece of land can hold a thousand people. So we just don't know what is the carrying capacity of the human on earth or any other planet for that matter, because we're also trying to get there, <laughs> you see? And that's the challenge. So that argument is sufficient to deflate the, uh, at least from the biological perspective, the fact that the world is overpopulated as a whole. In fact, I have a whole lecture dedicated to the supposed overpopulation of, of humans in the world. Here we have back to our cousins, the chimps. This guy is obviously the alpha male. And this fellow over here that's getting hit by a stick is probably a beta, a beta male, the next in line who's trying to mate with the harem of the alpha male. And there's no way he's gonna permit that, the alpha male. So the alpha male is actually using a tool, a weapon. Interesting. Yeah, he's using a weapon to get this guy out. All right, so the beta male just has to wait a little longer until the alpha male is no longer able to hold that stick well enough. And then the beta male will pick up the stick and hit the alpha male out of the way. And that will be replacement, <laughs> okay? But the, so there are all kinds of mechanisms that are stabilizing the population. 
limited resources. I talked about the moose. This could be uh, our royal up in uh, Lake Superior. It's a uh, beautiful island. It's actually a national park. One of the qualifications for national park in the United States, it has to be a unique environment. I had the privilege of uh, spending some, doing some camping for a couple of weeks in Al Royal. It's in Lake Superior, one of the largest lakes in the world. It is um, National Park. It's closer to Canada than it is to the US, but it's American. Yeah, here's Al Royal. Here is Canada. Here is the US. Copper Harbor. This is I took the ferry going this way in September. And uh, sorry, the ferry. Uh, oh, it says three and a half hours here. Yeah, when you're in the middle of Lake Superior, you can look all around. You don't see shores. It's huge. Lake Superior also has a tide, has its own tide. In other words, the volume of water is so large that it reacts to the pull on the moon. It has tides. But Al Royal is beautiful. It's 40 miles long. It's about eight miles wide on its widest side. It's full of lakes inside. And it's all nature trails and uh, has some lodging. I went there in September and came up here and did all the trails to cover that here. And I had to do all those trails only in four days because I took the last ferry in. It was September and the last ferry out was leaving from here uh, back to the US four days later. So I had to get here by force. After that, they shut the island down for the winter because they expect an average of 300 inches of snow. <laughs> <laughs> it is gorgeous, beautiful island. All right, it's populated by, and it's got a bunch of lakes inside, and it's populated by moose and wolves. So they have about a thousand moose, talk about stable population, and they have about two dozen wolves in two packs. One pack is on the northern part of the island, the other pack is on the southern part. So you can consider those two populations, even though their interaction between them. Some wolves migrate from one to the other. But uh, so the wolf is the top carnivore. The wolf feeds on the moose. The moose is a herbivore. So the limiting factor is the amount of maple saplings that are available. Here are the moose, so that's the wolf pack moving through. Oh, another thing that the ranger told me was uh, when you sleep at night, get off the trail because the same trails that humans use during the day, the moose and the wolves use at night. So the wolves are tracking the moose and the moose are just moving through the trails. And if they see a bag there, they'll just trample over it, the moose. So the moose will trample over the <laughs> hikers. It's not the first time that the hikers come in with broken ribs because the moose trampled over them. <laughs> so it was an exciting experience. Uh, and the population of moose is limited by the maple saplings that are available. And the maple, of course, are deciduous. They'll lose their leaves in the uh, winter. So the moose have to eat a lot of maple during the non-winter <laughs> to haul them off through uh, the winter when the wolves are most active, chasing them down. So the, wolf, yeah, so the wolves get skinny, the, wolf, the moose gets skinny. And on average, the wolf is going to take out the weaker moose. And the stronger moose, the most vigorous, Vigorous, on average, will survive a wolf pack uh, hunt. So uh, resources are always limited in nature. Here is a river. And only the banks of the river are colonized by trees. You can see that off the bank, there's not enough water to hold the biomass of a, uh, of a tree. So the water resource is definitely limited by the banks to the banks of the tree. Here's a, oops, here's a plastic bottle that has been floating on the ocean, on the surface of the ocean for some time, enough time to get a whole cluster, a whole population of barnacles to grow on it. 
And you notice that the barnacles are only growing on this part of the bottle. Why is that? Because the barren part of the bottle is the one that was floating up out of the water. So even the whole bottle was not available for the barnacles. Only the bottom of the bottle was available. And at some point, these barnacles ran out of space and they could not colonize the top because the top is exposed to the air and they need water because they have gills to, uh, to breathe with. All right, so limited space, limited food, limited water, a limited carcass. There's only one carcass here and these four, these five vultures are fighting for the one carcass, limited resources. On average, the strongest vulture is the one who's gonna have the first shot at the carcass. Now the carcass may be large enough that the alpha vulture here, which you can see clearly is the largest, most colorful guy, right? Is gonna have its fill and walk away. And then the others like the chicks, these ones that are tan color are probably chicks, will have to wait their turn. But if they're patient, they will get, if the, the most vigorous individual left something left in the carcass, then they'll have their chance too. So limited resources, right? Obvious. No two individuals are alike within the same species. Uh, talked about this ad nauseum, variation, right? These are all giraffes of the same species. These are all humans of the same species. These are all snails of the same species, orchids of the same species, and what are these uh, lilies? Look at this, these two lilies, they look pretty identical, right? But they also have an ultraviolet pattern. This is the ultraviolet pattern on the right. So on the left is the visible spectrum pattern. In other words, what we can see of the lily, this to us is obviously a yellow lily. But to some insects that can see in ultraviolet, the pattern of the lily is obviously orange and white, not yellow. Okay, and why would a lily have ultraviolet pattern if it's not for some insects that pollinize? Right? So observation, inference, there is plenty to select on. <laughs> So selection acts on variation. Remember, selection acts on variance, on the variance. I like this one. Selections, uh, variations are heritable. Right? They're passed on to the F generations, F1, F2, F3. Think about this, cichlids. I don't know if you've ever had aquariums, freshwater aquariums, the freshwater cichlids. They're very aggressive. And typically they don't tolerate any other fish in the aquarium sooner or later, they cut them out or they eat them up and they, they're, they're very territorial. And they establish territory by depth. So Lake Victoria and Lake uh, Tanganyika and Lake Turkana are part of the Great Rift Valley over here, which is pretty much considered the origin of humans and many other species is in equatorial Africa. Equatorial Africa spread through here. This is Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa. Okay, so Lake Victoria is famous for its cichlids. Today, it has about 400 species of cichlids, different species. When I say species, by definition, they're different. They don't mate with each other because that's one of the definitions for species, right? They don't intermate. These are just some examples of the cichlids over here. Different depths of the lake. So each species would specialize in a particular depth. And at that depth, what they find is the macro environment of the depth, they find a particular temperature, they find a particular algae or other organisms that they feed on and so forth. And that's how they establish their territory. And that's why they're very territorial. They have a narrow range of depth that is their territory. And by golly, they defend a territory to, to death. All right, so we got 400 species of cichlids living in Lake Victoria today. 
Lake Victoria was dry 17,000 years ago. It was bone dry, meaning no fish. And it got filled 14,000 years ago. So we have seen evolution of 400 species in 14,000 years. Interesting. The niche. The niche is a role, so it's a behavior thing that an organism plays in nature and is associated with a place, the place we call the habitat. So a niche is what an organism does in a habitat or the role, the function of an organism in a habitat. That's a niche. Okay? It's a very ecological term. It's all about niches, studying the niches of each species. So the range of the habitat could be huge, like for example, the range of lion, of a lion, um, what's it called? Not a pod, a lion, pride. pride, thank you. A pride, which is a population, right? The range of that pride is large for hunting. Or it could be very small, like aphids, which could be a single branch within a bush. Also, it could be continuous or discontinuous. The aphids on the bush move up and down and interchange branches, right? So it's a continuous, that's migration. Or it could be discontinuous, which is also known as patchy. Maya talks about patchy. Like, for example, in lichens, discontinuous range or niche habitat for a lichen. This is a piece of rock, and these spots are lichens. Remember, a lichen is a combination of algae and fungi. These are all lichens. Lichens are combinations of algae and fungi, whether we lichens or not, that's the way it is. See? And the, uh, the fungus provides a place for the lichen, for the algae in which to live. And the algae provides photosynthesis, that's why they're colored. Uh, shades, generally shades of green and they provide nourishment for the fungus. And then the fungus also puts out an acid, an acid that erodes the rock, the mineral of the rock. So that's why we see lichens growing on rocks. They are little by little eroding, digesting the rock. <laughs> I don't know if digesting is the proper term, but they're eroding because lichens uh, put out acid, organic acids that make the rock little by little fizzle like an alcohol over long periods of time. So basically lichens make soil because when the rock is, the minerals are dissolved and they go into the ground, they are putting minerals into the soil. So that's how lichens over a long period of time contribute to soil formation. And therefore that's why they're considered pioneers. They can go onto a barren rock <laughs> and start digesting or pulverizing that rock over long periods of time. But they're restrained to that particular rock. So that's a discontinuous at a small scale, or it could be at a large scale discontinuous. Here I'm just giving two examples of monkeys. The what is known as the old world monkeys, Africa or India or Asia, and new world monkeys divided by oceans. Okay, so these again are discontinuous or patchy uh, niches and habitats. It could be very small, as small as a piece of a rock, 
or as large as a whole continent. So basically selection is a process of elimination. Elimination. On average, again, this is all a statistical, it's a probabilistic model. On average, the most fit are the ones who survive and the less fit get selected out. Now the fitness is not necessarily a muscular fitness because when we talk about fitness, we think of the gym, but plants have no muscle and plants are fit because they're alive. And so the fitness that we're talking about is actually genetic fitness. So we start with the genotype and that genotype may or may not express into a phenotype. So now you get these three grizzlies here that are right at the edge of the rapids and along comes the salmon or the trout. I don't know what it is, but it's one of these jumping uh, fish that has to go back to the source where it was, uh, where it spawned to lay its eggs. And along the way, in addition to negotiating the rapids, this fish also have to negotiate the, the hungry grizzly bears <laughs> with open mouth waiting for them. Now it's perilous. You know, they're right at the edge of the, uh, of the rapid, as you can see here, these muscular grizzlies. But of these three, everything else being equal, which is the most fit of these three grizzlies? Yeah, this guy looks to be the most fit. This other guy is actually looks kind of scary there. He's scared. He's, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> so maybe over a long period of time, this guy in the background will not get enough fish and will start getting weaker and weaker and will be replaced. Maybe this was this grizzly in the background. It's darker color, I'm just guessing totally, but maybe this was the alpha male until this hunting season. <laughs> and after this hunting season, this beta male is gonna replace him because he's getting stronger by the fish that he's catching. An example, on the fish side, well, on average, the trout or the salmon that can negotiate these mouths and get away, you know, will survive. So on average, we think that it's as strong as the one that can jump the hardest and so on and so forth. So you can make the arguments. You can see that fitness is at the genetic level. In other words, the genotype that may or may not express it to a phenotype when, when it does express, that's the edge. The most fit on average will tend to survive. And so selection is a selecting out. And there you see the elegance of the mechanism because on average, who's getting selected out? The less fit, which means that the more fit tend to survive. What do they do when they survive? They pass on their genes. They tend to pass on their genes because they're gene bags that migrate in and out of populations. And so there's a built-in mechanism for quality control in nature that is constantly, there's a selective pressure that is constantly purifying that species. All right, selection itself is a two-step process when we consider the zygote as the fence. One can be on one side of the fence or the other side of the fence. So the zygote is at the fence. Before the zygote is called pre-zygotic selection. After the zygote is called post-zygotic selection. Straightforward. So pre-zygotic selection is basically the selection is done on the gametes through meiosis. And the production of, this is just terminology, the production of gametes is called gametogenesis. It occurs in the sex glands, ovaries and testes. Then if everything goes according to nature, there is fertilization. Once we have fertilization, we have a zygote of whatever species, including the plants. And what are the equivalents of the ovaries and testes in plants? The flowers in the angiosperms, 
or uh, the uh, cones in the gymnosperms, like as in conifers, pine trees, right? So anything that reproduces sexually starts with a zygote. A single individual of the same species that given time will grow to be like its parents. So post-zygotic selection is a selection that is done from the zygote forward up until adult. And remember that adult is defined biologically as capable of reproducing. In other words, a juvenile becomes an adult when he or she is producing gametes that are fertile. That's the biological definition of an adult. So when you translate that to the human, it's a very scary thing because the teenager is already fertile and biologically an adult, but psychologically, most likely not there yet. And they need to wait about another dozen years. So the human egg and sperm mature, or the, the human ovaries and testicles mature on average around 10 to 12 years of age on average. But the human brain does not mature until on average between 20 to 25 years of age. So on average 22, 22 and a half years. So they still have another dozen years before they have a full brain, literally. <laughs> but they already have full reproductive organs. And that's a very dangerous situation. The phenomenon of adolescence. All right, so being fertile is adulthood. Normally, naturally, mating occurs. And then the fertile offspring, that's what defines the, uh, the species. So all these stages need to occur. And that's why we cannot verify that an embryo uh, belongs to a particular species until that embryo has reproduced and that offspring has generated, has also reproduced. So we need grandparents, parents, and children to be able to confirm, <laughs> you know, biologically the species. Because the offspring have to be fertile offspring. So how do we know the offspring is a fertile offspring? Well, that offspring becomes an adult. Can you follow the argument? So this little baby needs to become an adult, mate, have children, and that child needs to be fertile. So that child needs to grow and mate and have children. <laughs> biologically speaking. So selection can happen all the way along these three generations. Let's say that this little embryo, which came from this zygote, this is a micrograph of uh, sperm fertilizing an egg, uh, was the most fit sperm, the most fit egg, generated this most fit embryo. Nine months later was born in the, into this most fit baby. 30 years later, 25 years later, they married into this most fit couple and had their most fit baby who also uh, grew up to have most fit grandchildren, <laughs> right? That's under ideal conditions, but anything could go wrong between the fertilization and the third generation, whereby Tragically, God forbid, that most fit individual was taken out. And it doesn't have to be tragic in the sense of death, a car accident, or a nuclear bomb. It could be that they just never found the right mate and didn't mate. Or even if they found the right mate, it turns out that the mate is infertile. And that's a dead end. So you see, many, many things can happen. You can stack the deck. And that's all selection one way or another. Now, I've used a human here, but when you put that in nature, that's natural selection. So the natural selection can be pre-zygotic or can be post-zygotic, right? Uh, 
events processes yes yeah we're looking at the mechanism on how is it possible for what did darwin mean by natural selection because that's the title of the book by means of natural selection so he's saying evolution occurs how does it occur give me the how at least well the me the how is natural selection and then he goes into uh, explanation after explanation of how natural selection works. It has been uh, studied and systematized, right? So, um, for example, you know, if UV hits the reproductive organs, that's going to start selecting out, or if the, the best sperm did not fertilize the egg, that's also selecting out and so on and so forth. What happens to other 149,999,999 sperm. They got selected out for whatever reason, but they got selected out. All right, this is a principle that is operative in nature. And it works like this, again, on average, statistically. It's called the competitive exclusion principle. Two different species, two different species competing for the same resources cannot inhabit the same niche for any period of time. Okay, so let's look at an example. Here we have a tree with black bugs and yellow birds. And the yellow birds feed on the black bugs. Then along comes a flock of red birds. They also feed on the black bugs. And they are a little larger on average. The red birds are a little average, larger on average. And it turns out that it's easier to pick the black bugs from the trunk than from the canopy of the tree. So the red birds naturally are gonna go for the low hanging fruit. The easier way to pick the bugs, the black bugs is on the trunk, but there's only that many branches on the trunk that they can perch on, which were originally populated by the yellow birds. So what are the red birds gonna do? They're going to displace the yellow birds and the yellow birds will have to go into a harder place, the canopy, for picking their black bugs. Because now the trunk is taken up by the red birds, which happen to be a little stronger or bigger. So that's the competitive exclusion principle. Two different species, they may be related species. They may even be two populations of the same species, two different populations. The only difficulty there is that those generally, those two different populations of the same species would live in two different geographical regions. But there's, there's a bottleneck where they have to come to a single region. One population will exclude the other eventually. And that's the competitive exclusion principle. So that ex exclusion is a means of natural selection. What's gonna happen? We can play it forward. It's easier to pick the bugs on the trunk. It's harder to pick the bugs in the canopy. So these yellow birds are gonna have a harder time picking those bugs. On average, it will be the most fit yellow birds that would pick the black bugs. So the red birds introduced a selective pressure on the yellow birds by displacing them from the original territory. On average, we can say, we play this forward, on average, only the most fit yellow birds will survive this invasion of uh, red birds because of the displacement issue. So all living creatures have a niche in nature and there's a balance. So at some point, eventually the yellow birds will go to the canopy and those who survive, survive. And the red birds will stick to the trunk and do their thing. And you can have the same tree with yellow birds and red birds, but they're gonna be in different parts of the tree. So those are two niches, 
So it's a yellow niche and a red niche. Yes, it could be the one can negotiate through the canopy. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it really, it starts getting complicated, right? It's all about the niche and the habitat and how to negotiate that and the environmental factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can ask the next question, which is what does selection act on or act upon? So it's a selective pressure, right? And what does it act on? The first layer is going to be the phenotype of the individual. Kind of makes sense. Think about, it's a process of elimination. What is being selected on the salmon is the phenotype. In other words, the muscular um, fitness of that salmon to be able to negotiate the rapids and the bears along the way at the same time. So let's say that the phenotype is the muscular fitness of that uh, salmon. That's the first layer of selection. And here's an example of first layer selection in all of the species, in all of the different groups. The protease, remember, is that grab bag of mostly unicellular organisms, protozoans, algae, so the phenotype on the algae, for example, the one that has the algae that has the best chlorophyll pigments for photosynthesizing is the one that's going to survive. The amoeba that is able to produce the pseudopods uh, better, quicker, and so forth is the one that's going to survive. In fungi, the little strings of the fungi is called the hyphae, the ones that can produce the more uh, vigorous hyphae, more filamentous hyphae that can tap into humidity or nutrients. That's the fungus that's gonna survive. Plants, a lot about the photosynthesis thing. In animals, the tissue. So the first object is going to be the phenotype of the individual. At the four levels, what do I mean by the four levels? Morphological, physiological, molecular, and behavioral. Because all those are phenotypes, right? Morphological is the shape. Physiological is the function, the metabolism. Molecular, is metabolism at the cellular level. And behavioral is at the level of the entire individual. At those four levels, selection acts on any one of those four or two or three or four at the same time. So you see, we go from complexity to complexity. So the phenotype is both stable and evolvable. In other words, it's stable as we observe it right now, looking through the window outside this classroom, whatever nature we see, it looks fairly stable right now. There's a limited number. There's actually an opossum family that lives, uh, sorry, um, a raccoon family that lives in our forest. And they have usually two or three cubs every year, replacement and so forth, we get too many. The other ones become so recruited, they have to move out or they die off. So there's a stable population of raccoons that live in our forest here at St. Thomas University, okay? So they're stable. And it has to do with uh, the limited resources. But it's also evolvable. There is a plasticity. For example, legs have evolved independently many times in nature. Think of a clam and this the muscular foot is a type of a leg because it's used for locomotion, for moving the clam around and for burying the clam into the, into the sand when the water hits the, the shore. So that's a foot that evolved independently 
from the tube feet of a starfish that has a water vascular system. It actually takes water from the environment, the starfish, and pumps it into the system to move the tube feet around. The sea urchins have the same thing. Very, very different uh, morphology, right? And different also from an insect. In this case, a little praying mantis here that has uh, three pairs of legs that are articulated with an exoskeleton, totally different morphologically than the tube feet of a starfish or the muscular foot of a clam. So the foot, the lo locomotion mechanism has evolved in nature many times independently from each other. Same with the eye, for example. Okay, so that's the primary object of selection. Okay. So we need to speed it up a little bit. Got half an hour. The second object of selection could be the gametes, or it could be a group selection. And times the entire population is subject to selection, subject to selection as in the case of the red and yellow birds. So the entire group, right? Or it could be kin selection. Kin selection is the family or the siblings of, of a particular group or a population, maybe subject to selection, kin selection. Interspecies selection is when one species is superior to another, is more fit than another. And it's capable of replacing or invading a new area. The example we have here, for example, in, again, in our forest, is a slash pine forest, I've commented. It's a slash pine forest. Let me just show you a little picture so I'm talking about it. There's a map, satellite. It's a big Google satellite here. Why is it not coming up? We used to have satellite. No, it is the same. Which one? Here? This one? Or this one? Yeah. I was looking at the Google, Google Maps. Used to be a satellite map. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious. Oh, let's just try Miami. By this thing? By your, your oh, here? Oh. Yeah, right. Yeah, could be. Oh, let's see if I move. Uh, hmm. <laughs> oh, uh, right. Sorry, folks. Oh, I don't want to stop the, uh, do that. <laughs> Sorry, getting distracted, get it. 
Anyway, we have a forest and it's uh, slash pine is the native species. And then uh, we have a lot of introduced species that are invasive animals and plants, but especially uh, the plants are taken over from other parts of the world. So those are invasive and they need to be eradicated. Otherwise they'll just replace over time, they'll replace the native species, okay? And it will become a tropical rainforest instead of a coniferous forest, which is what it is now. Mm -hmm. Finally, clad selection, when a whole group is taken out large, a whole clad, we're talking about uh, the dinosaurs, for example, that was taken out, the dinosaurs by a meteorite. That's a catastrophic event. It has to be typically a drastic change, typically in climate, or the environment, that drastic change, when it's catastrophic, it can take out, kill uh, an entire clad. An entire clad could be a large group of many different species, many species that may be related or not. And that's what is thought that took out the dinosaurs, many, many species of dinosaurs back about 65 to 70 million years ago. And what that did is it opened up a space, it opened up a niche throughout the whole world for the mammals. At the same time, the earth got cooler and dinosaurs considered to be closer to reptiles than to, than to mammals, did not tolerate the cold. And so they didn't come back. Whatever few dinosaurs survived, which were typically small, uh, did not survive the cold weather. The ones that did became lizards, the lizards of today and snakes, all the reptiles, but it became the age of mammals. So mammals took over the niche that was opened up by wiping out the dinosaurs. And the dinosaurs as a whole is a clad because there are many, many different species we know from the fossil record. So why is evolution so slow? Well, it's all relative, right? The word slow is relative. Relative to what? Slow in geologic time, but geologic time is okay. It's slow for us because our average lifetime is 80 years, more or less. But the vast majority of the current species that we see are adapted. They're well adapted, they're stable. So unless there is dramatic change in the environment, as an example with climate change, <laughs> right? There's a drastic change in the environment, the species tend to be the same because they stabilize, they're at the carrying capacity and nature replaces itself. Of course, there are cycles, there are yearly cycles and seasonal cycles and all that, but this, the populations are stable. Given a drastic chance, we can change, we can expect evolution. And the issue of the superbugs is one example that I can think of that we see on their own eyes within a short years, sometimes even months. The superbugs is the bacteria that are immune to just about any antibiotic that we have so far. How do they come about? Well, because I get infected, I take antibiotics, and the antibiotics that I take kill 99.99% of the bacteria. That leaves 0.001% alive, meaning that that 0.001% of bacteria are immune to this antibiotic. But because I have billions of bacteria, that 0.001% actually translates into thousands of individual bacteria who are all immune to the antibiotic. Within, tw within 20 minutes, under ideal conditions, they will duplicate their population. So we get into a exponential growth curve. And within a few hours, we have gazillion bacteria who are all immune to that particular antibiotic. They survived it. They had a mutant, right? That's the case why I cannot emphasize this enough. Do not ever use the antibacterial soap. When we use the antibacterial soap in normal use and wear of washing our hands from the streets or at home or whatever, we are killing 99.99% of the bacteria with that soap but the 0.001 bacteria are surviving that soap. <laughs> and it's just a gimmick 
from the industry to try to sterilize us, but we cannot live sterile lives because then our immune system will be compromised because then we don't stimulate our immune system. So get away from the antibacterial soap as soon as possible and tell all your friends and family about it. <laughs> Only doctors in surgical situations should be using that soap. You see my argument? We need to have a minimal amount of infection to stimulate our immune system, and that's nature. So the superbugs that develop over time in hospitals are very dangerous, and they tend to live in the air conditioning system. That's why today, after open heart surgery, they kick you out of the hospital within 48 hours <laughs> because they don't want you, the hospital doesn't want you getting their superbugs that are in there somewhere. See, so it's a drastic situation. And it's in my mind, I, you doctors tell me, is this an example of evolution occurring on their own eyes? Right there, okay? So we have to be very careful. All right, sexual selection. We can do this in 20 minutes or less. <laughs> yes, in the sense that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not random. It's not random, okay? So it is, I guess it's a kind of artificial selection, but nature also has it. So it's not artificial in that sense, all right? But sexual selection is the third type of selection, just by the adjective. So we talked about artificial selection that is willed, then it doesn't naturally occur, but natural selection does, but natural selection presupposes random mating. Otherwise, it's already skewed. It's not, it's not uh, on average, right? So random selection, uh, sec um, natural selection presupposes random mating. The pollen grain doesn't know what egg it's going to fertilize, what flower it's going to fertilize. But sexual selection is uh, non-random because it involves mate choice, mate choice. Now, the mate choice doesn't have to be voluntary like we do in humans. It could be instinctive, right? And typically it will involve two mechanisms, male competition and female choosing the male the most fit male. Again, on average. So let's look briefly at those. First, we have to understand something about the morphology since this can occur at the four levels, morphological, physiological, behavioral, and molecular. The most obvious one by first impression is the morphology, the shape, right? The shapeology of the creature. So, it's what we call dimorphism between male and female. Di meaning two, two morphs, two different shapes, two different sizes. So dimorphism can be dramatic, can be moderate, or it can be no dimorphism to the plain eye. For example, here is a male and a female gorilla. The female gorilla, it's actually closer to the size of a chimp, but it's not a chimp, it's a gorilla, all right? So definitely the female is selecting the biggest male. That's the selection there. So the female is selecting on the fitness and the fitness in this case, phenotypically is expressed by the male in his size. So this is a, a dramatic dimorphism. Dramatic is not the proper term, extreme dimorphism. And it could be the male is the larger or it could be the female is the larger. And many frogs and amphibians and other fish, the female is the larger and the male is the smaller. It depends, it can be flipped, all right? So, but this is dimorphism. In other words, two different shapes of the same species based on male, female. Or it could be no dimorphism. These are clownfish. Many fish are identical male and female, at least to the look. However, they know, the male and the female know which is which. 
How they know, who knows? But uh, only God and they know, but <laughs> they know, all right? There's no dimorphism. Other fish do have dimorphism like the guppies, for example. So this issue of the selection is pretty uh, complex and sophisticated. Speaking of fish, these are the Siamese fighting fish, also known as beta splendens. If you ever had aquariums, right? You know that you cannot put two males together because the two males will kill each other. They will rip each other's gills out. <laughs> They would chew on each other's gills, gills. And so they, they um, display their maleness by the fanciness of their fins. Mm -hmm. And so this, by the way, is done through artificial selection because they have great variety, variation. This is similar to the peacock, it's a little uh, lovebirds equivalent, all right, in fish, but this is the male. The female is rather drab, not too good looking, but the female has a very choosy eye and will choose the more fancy male <laughs> by the looks, by the morphology. And these males will compete with each other for sure. If you wanna get one of these Siamese fighting fish to display on his own, all you need to do is put a little mirror in front of it. And it thinks it's an enemy, it thinks it's another male and will display fully. Don't do it too long because that can be considered fish cruelty, cruelty to an animal. If you display a mirror in front of the beta all the time, then the male is constantly displaying and, and, and showing off, uh, but it's stressing the fish. <laughs> so it'd be considered cruelty to animals. <laughs> all right, uh, males fighting. And typically the contest is not to death, but they will, it's just showing fitness. So literally in this case is, has to do with a strength, with muscular fitness. Here are two male, what are these elk? And don't miss the females in the back. One female seems to be interested. The other one doesn't seem to be interested in the fight, at least from the looks. But maybe she's looking from the corner of her eye, we don't know. So these two males are fighting each other, pushing each other, and eventually one of the two will walk away before they get hurt. And the one that stands would on average be the alpha male. And so now he's gathering his harem. That's very typical for mammals. It's just a show of uh, strength, of vigor. Oh, that's another word for fitness, vigor. In humans, of course, it uh, gets very complicated because both the male and the female select. And it's very, very sophisticated. Anything from perfume to, <laughs> to the type of car we drive. <laughs> I'm a disco baby, so I just put uh, dancing as one of the things, one of the selection <laughs> things that we use <laughs> to show our fitness or unfitness. <laughs> Now, dancing today has become ridiculous, really. It's horrible. I mean, how do you dance to rap, right? <laughs> it used to be more elegant. I think it stopped right around disco was kind of the last time. You can take it back to the foxtrot and to the, oh, to the middle age dances that involve very elaborate courtship thing. That's all courtship. That's showing fitness, vigor. Who could dance, you know, who could uh, lay it out? <laughs> who could dish it out? Anyway, it's all about staying alive, right? <laughs> now, there's uh, lastly a thing called runaway selection. Runaway selection is when it really gets out of hand. So for example, the peacock, right? What do you think the pea hen is selecting on? Oh, my little chat, excuse me for a moment, there's a chat. Staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> I know, you and I, we go back. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was uh, Travolta, no? <laughs> the BJs? Yeah, you remember too, right? <laughs> Saturday night fever. Exactly, Saturday night fever. That's right. 
Tonight I have to give a test. <laughs> that's my fever. <laughs> that's, that's very, my fever is trying to get these, these two knuckleheads that are trying to graduate in May. <laughs> so I have to give my, an extra test tonight. <laughs> All right, so what do you think the P hen is selecting on the peacock? The display of the tail, right? Which the peacock normally that tail is down. <laughs> and when the female comes around, the tail will go up and he'll flutter like this. You can actually really hear it. And but it's interesting is that the there's more than just the tail. The tail actually becomes a frame. But what's in the front of the tail is is the neck of the bird and then the little feathers on the top. So uh, watch this, uh, uh, peacock. It's interesting to see the whole bird in display in a natural way, right? That's a photo. So it's not just the tails, the tail is the frame. It looks like a bunch of eyes, right? But also check out the front of the bird and then the head and the little crown that it has on top. This little feathers up there, why that? You know, that's so odd. This little plume, this little crest, right? So that's what the pea hen is seeing as a whole. So she's selecting on this, okay? And she's fixated on the most splendid of these, of this display. She's fixated on it, which means that she will only pick the most exotic male. And so on average, that most exotic male carries these genes from their chicks. There will be a variety of males of which on average, the male chicks, I don't know how many chicks peacocks have, peahens, but there will be several of the males. There will be variety. And the one that has the more exotic variation of the display, on average, that's the one that's going to get picked by the peahen, the next generation. So there's a fixation there, and it becomes runaway to where there's no limit to the exoticness of, or exoticity, I don't know how you say that word, to being the most exotic, all right? Every single generation. And that's why it's called runaway selection. And it's to the detriment because when this peacock has to carry this tail around, it's not an easy thing. It can get caught in the woods. It can get caught in the branches. They actually fly, but they cannot fly for a long period of time. They do short flights because the body mass, the biomass is so large and so heavy that it, they can only fly for a short period of time. So it makes them more susceptible to prey, which by the way, the peacock comes from where? India. We have one peacock here that was, yeah, the peacock is all over, it's invasive. In South Florida, we have them all over the place. It's a big problem. The peacocks in uh, in uh, South Miami, uh, Coconut Grove is full of them. They scratch the cars, they poop all over the place. The male stays up all night singing away, yelling for the female. And plus they eat caterpillars like crazy. And so they wipe out the butterfly populations. <laughs> anyway, they're invasive. They're gorgeous, but they're invasive. And uh, they're from India. The problem is they don't have natural enemies because what's the natural enemy for a peacock? A Bengal tiger. <laughs> so we're not gonna bring in Bengal tigers into Coconut Grove to get rid of the peacocks, okay? It's a problem. So they are reproducing like gangbusters and uh, we have them all over the place. But anyway, that's an example of what is known as runaway selection. The peahen is fixated on the most exotic display of the male. And so it's kind of locked in to always be this. At some point, what happens is when the 
when the plumage gets totally too exotic, that male will not make it to reproductive success because he just got caught in the branches or finally got in by a tiger. <laughs> and so did not make it to reproductive success. Okay. So even runaway selection has its limits. This is an example that occurs in many species, plant, uh, animals. Uh, this is uh, an example of beetles. This is the male beetle that has this horn up here. Now, the male beetle doesn't use this horn for anything. It's just display for the female because the female is fixated on these horns. They will use the horn to um, spar. The male uh, beetles will use the horn to spar with each other, very similar to the elk. Where was it? I missed it. Wow. Did I wipe it out? Oh, here. Yes. So again, how many points on the on the rack, right? This is called a rack, the horns of the uh, of this elk, how many points they have. And the larger the rack, the more powerful on average, okay? But the more cumbersome because those racks can get cut in between the, the branches and they could be easier prey for the wolf pack that is just lingering around. So those are examples of runaway selection. Doesn't happen in every species, but it happens in a few. And typically those are the ones that produce these exotic animals. The lyre birds and birds of paradise. It, it occurs mostly in birds and in uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, amazing, look at this. Uh, there are some, uh, some birds that are just gorgeous. Um, the toucan, of course, for the beak. And uh, what is that one called? The um, bird of paradise. You can look at some uh, videos of, I uh, guess, the flower. Nope, sorry. <laughs> Getting too exotic. <laughs> uh, Lyre bird is one that is very pretty. It's a strange tail. With that display. <laughs> So you can look at uh, some videos of these doing their dance. Uh, they're typically from Southeast Asia. Cats, yes. Okay, well, I don't want to get distracted. You can use many of these videos, uh, check them out. <laughs> How do I get out of here? Hi, my name is Raina Ida, and you're watching Animal Logic's World of Birds. How do I get out? Oh, Australia. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsor for this week's episode of Magellan. I can't get out. <laughs> it's no secret by this point that Magellan offers some of the best documentaries available anywhere. And the next great extension event is one of the best we've seen in the memory. We're at the tipping point
Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. What was her action? Oh, actually, that was an interesting conversation of mass exigio. Maybe we'll look at that when we get into the environmental course uh, in the fall. All right, folks, so that's what I have. It's, uh, you've seen then selection, which is the one that really, that's what causes the, uh, has the possibility of causing evolution, right? Selection, which uh, we have been using in human um, agriculture, animal husbandry, and more, or more recently in the pet industry. And then, uh, but natural selection as such implies random mating. Whereas sexual selection, there's made choice. And that's overall a, a package of this uh, process. Now from here, we're going to go into adaptedness, which will be the next chapter. Meyer, I think it's chapter seven. You have a text there, adaptedness. Let me check for a moment. And then um, I think we're gonna stop there with Meyer and we'll continue with the evolutionary process, then we're gonna switch into human selection, do some biology about that, and then we're gonna do some philosophy and theology and anthropology about human evolution, again, as a species. So, Are adaptedness. Uh, anagenesis, anagenesis, yes, the group. Yes, Christina. Uh, you ask us to remind you about uh, the internship and the bio 514. Excellent, thank you. So before I stop the recording itself, any questions or comments? Nobody, I don't hear anything. Okay, then I'm going to uh, stop the recording so I can start down.